Good morning, good afternoon, um, wherever you are in the country. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you uh, here with us today for this um, important conversation, exciting conversation. Mark Carney, lovely to have you with us on Canada 2020. And uh, Mark is joining us today, I believe, from his home in Ottawa. So um, we will get started. Just a little bit of housekeeping to um, frame things up here. Um, I'd like to start by thanking our, our uh, sustaining partners and our donors, uh, those who make the work here at 2020 possible, especially this year. Uh, we are particularly grateful for your continued support. It's very important uh, to us. So thank you very much for that. Um, we will be able to take your questions today, uh, and I look forward to them. And uh, I believe um, by entering your questions on the Zoom Q&A function, the, uh, they will be uh, sent to me. I'm not sure that we will be able to get to all of them, but we will do our best. So please um, send a note, tell us who you are, where you're uh, watching the Zoom, and um, send us a question. That would be uh, great. So um, on that, I think uh, I don't... Mark, I'm not sure that you need a huge introduction, but uh, I will say that you are currently the UN Special Envoy for Climate and Finance, and as well the UK's Finance Advisor for COP26. So um, that is taking up, uh, I suppose, a good piece of your, um, your thinking and your time these days. Previously, uh, Governor of the Bank of Canada and as well, uh, Governor of the Bank of England. So today, our conversation is going to focus on your new book, uh, Values, Building a Better World for all. This is, uh, first of all, congratulations, Mark. Uh, the book is, um, it's, it's very deep. <laughs> it's uh, very thoughtful. It is meticulously researched and um, I've enjoyed uh, uh, getting into it uh, over the course of this weekend. So tell us a little bit about um, your idea for the book. When did that come to you? And um, you talk a little bit about planning in this book. Did you have a plan for the book? Did, did the writing of the book follow your plan? And um, is the product kind of what you thought it would be as you, as you got started on this project? Great. Well, thank you. Uh, first off, thank you, Anna, and thanks Canada 2020 and all of you for, uh, Canada 2020 for having me and you for joining and hope you can, you can stay to the end of the, uh, this hour. Um, the, uh, in terms of a plan, uh, yes, and part of the point uh, in, in the book in terms of crisis management is uh, Tim Geithner's refrain, the plan beats no plan. I had a plan. Uh, it wasn't a perfect plan. My plan was uh, just at the turn of last year, so just over you know the holidays, I decided that actually I was going to have about six months of relatively free time. I didn't know how free it was actually going to end up being. Um, and I had a unique opportunity to pull together my thoughts on, on these types of issues, uh, draw on the experience of uh, being at the heart of a number of crises, um, and try to look through to some underlying causes and what to do about it. You know, to have very much a forward-looking book. I didn't want to spend 90% of the time on these are all the problems and we're headed off a cliff and then end with platitudes. And so really about two thirds or at least half of the book is, is, is what to do. Um, but your question's right in terms of, you know, did I know where I was going to end up? No, I didn't know exactly where I was going to end up, uh, which was so part of the process, the thought process was actually to go through the writing. Um, as it turned out, of course, um, I, like everybody else, had uh, you know events interceded. I had more time um, to work at it, um, with the sole exception of um, the UN work, which uh, which fortunately, uh, with the crisis, expanded in its uh, in its scope and breadth. Because one of the things, and you know, try and link it back into the book, one of the things that we saw, I think we've all seen, is that this, this focus on values and the focus at least on one of the two of the values around resilience and sustainability really came to the forefront. We all saw it you know, uh, through COVID, uh, applied it to climate, um, and that has meant that uh, the COP process has been much, much more engaged and the private sector has been much more engaged than um, if we were talking this time last year than I would have expected it, even in my most optimistic moments. Well, that's positive then. Yeah, very much so. Very much yeah. so. I mean, there, there are positives that, that have come out of this experience, <laughs> and we have to. We, as as you, as you are locked in your home, and I'm locked in my home, and those watching are locked in. I uh, suspect their homes, or um, uh, we have to. We have to uh, find them and and build on them. Yeah, um, I, I think. Um, I mean, I would start right into the concept of asking you what is a market society, and. Mm -hmm. 
you know, how did we get there? Uh, and, you know, I could preamble a little bit, but I think it's probably easier for you in your own words to kind of set that concept in this conversation and, um, you know, the role yeah. it has in your book and your thinking. Yeah, sure. The, um, and so just, just to be clear, the, for those who haven't had a chance to read it, um, which would be almost everyone, I suppose, um, the, the reason it's called values with parentheses is, is because of parentheses around the S is that the relationship goes both ways. There's a sort of value in the market influencing values in society. So your question about the market society, but also, and I'm sure we'll come to it later, how if we elevate our values in society, such as sustainability um, or equality, those, those aspects, then that can affect how the market reacts and how the market helps fulfill them. So the relationship goes in, in both directions. In terms of the drift uh, towards a market society, um, I mean, what is it? Um, it's, it's, it's a world where um, if something is not priced, uh, it's not valued. So there, it creates an incentive. And we, we, we collectively, not just in Canada, but elsewhere, have drifted towards this uh, over a number of decades, and really accelerated by the Thatcher-Reagan revolution, which you know, had its positives, but led to a sort of market fundamentalism. And the answer to um, challenges increasingly became to bring something into the market if it wasn't already in the market. Mm -hmm. uh, the extreme version of that was in finance in the run-up to um, uh, the financial crisis where the market was the answer to everything and markets built on markets ended up collapsing and the book goes through uh, you know examples of that um but it's a broader point it's um you know um the uh how we look at the environment and um, you know the fact that we have a system as, as as i say in the book that we can value amazon the company you know to the nearest you know million dollars you know 1.7 trillion I, I think at last check but the value of amazon the region only occurs when it's stripped of all its foliage and converted to farmland. There's no price on the Amazon the region. So there's, that's out of kilter. We see examples where um, paying for charity, um, sort of incentives to pay people to do what had been charitable acts, in the end actually reduces the incentives and the performance of those acts. Um, you see it in blood donations, you see it in a bunch of other cases. Um, fines become fees, all, all these examples. So it's just getting out of kilter uh, between the role of market, the role of society, and and the corrosion that happens with that. And, and so the question the book's asking by looking through the various crises is, well, how do we put it back into balance? What are the other values as, apart from efficiency, mm -hmm. uh, dynamism that um, is necessary for uh, you know, a truly prosperous and inclusive economy? Mm -hmm. So the thinking on um, these, the three great crises that uh, you posit have shaped this your, your thinking on um, the future in terms of how we look at climate, but the other two being, as you just mentioned, uh, credit, the financial crisis and COVID, which we're still currently navigating. Maybe we could start by going back um, a little bit to 2008 and to that credit crisis, which, I mean, it, it feels like a long time ago in some ways, because so much has happened since then, but it really isn't that old a history. It is still quite re recent history in, in, by most measures. Yeah. And in particular, you know, I'm thinking of the part in the book where you maybe you could take us back to that first meeting that you had in um, in Basel, I think it was, with other um, yeah. bank governors, and and what that looked like, and and you know how what that was at that time. It was a uh, it was a remarkable introduction to, <laughs> to that world. I had um, I had taken the job or been uh, you know given the honor of the job uh, a few months before. And one of the things I was thinking, you know, I had a young, we had a young family and I thought, you know, okay, nice predictable job, eight decisions a year on interest rates and, uh, you know, home by five type thing. And uh, it couldn't screw it up. And of course, immediately we had the crisis and, and we had, there was a Canadian component to the crisis, which never really, I mean, Canadians were aware of it um, vaguely, but we resolved it. So it didn't hit the, hit the world. Um, but uh, yeah, first meeting, February 2008 uh, in Basel with um, the other uh, central bank governors. And um, uh, there's a sort of ritual to welcome me to it, which, um, and then Jean-Claude Trichet, who's the chair of this group, a uh, group of 10, uh, says, okay, we've got an hour to figure out uh, how to save the system or everything's lost. Um, ben, what are you in for? You know, how much, <laughs> wow, okay, Better pay attention. Um, and, uh, you know, we, uh, so it was, uh, and it was true, but that was part of a series of band-aids effectively that rolled forward for about 
seven months until Lehman Brothers failed. Uh, yeah. And then we really did have to, the collective, we had to backstop the system. And that's the point where that, you know, the pendulum of market, that market fundamentalism was done then. And the question was for the financial sector, how do you, how to rebalance, reinstill responsibility in the sector, reinstill a sense of sense, uh, resilience, sense uh, sustainability, um, so that the system was working for the broader economy. I would, I would, you know, you would expect me to say this, Anna, um, being very involved in it. I think it largely succeeded those reforms, but there were those reforms and not broader reforms and not a broader set of measures um, in enough countries um, to rebalance things. And, um, and that's where we, you know, we face some of the challenges we all face today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you talked about the, the work you did at the FSC following that and yeah. hundreds of, of resolutions that went to the, through the G20 over a decade. So the work to get the, the safety and some security built back into that system was something you continued to pursue. And it takes time. It really, it's not something that you can turn around quickly. Yeah, I think there's two things of, I mean, of interest. And, you know, given this Canada 2020, I know you think a lot about the global system as well as, you know, what we do here in Canada. And I think what's interesting from the G20 or called financial stability uh, board uh, reforms um, is that this isn't treaty based reforms. These were getting the principles from various countries together, hammer out the solutions to end banks being too big to fail or change the derivative markets so they don't collapse when there's you know a, a strong wind type thing um, make those changes but then everybody goes home and implements them tailored to their local circumstances um, so they're not exactly the same rules in all our jurisdictions but you have a degree of reliance on each other because you know you're trying to achieve the same outcome and that's in my judgment that's sort of where multilateralism is headed mm -hmm. you know the rules-based system I, I don't think is coming back and so it's a question of where you, we can find as like-minded countries as possible now there's one huge necessary exception to that which is on climate change because you can't just have a pool of countries solving climate change you can have them contributing to it so that was um uh the, you know those reforms and those reforms were really put to the test uh, starting this time last year when COVID hit and you know the dog that didn't bark the the the, the, the part of the system that definitely was ready for an unknown unknown which at least in the case of finance was a pandemic was finance um, so, you know, by they, but they have passed that test, doesn't mean they're perfect, and there's still a lot that we need to do in order to get finance um, uh, aligned with what society has chosen uh, to do, rightly so, is, which is to address climate change. Yeah. That, um, as we leave, so if we go from the credit then into the, the, the current COVID crisis, and we're talking about resilience, and some pieces actually were a little more resilient, as you've just pointed out than others, but there was advice from scientists, you, you talk about this as well in the book, about steps that countries could be taking to prepare for a, a potential pandemic or something like this. And unfortunately, overwhelmingly, and it's not unique to Canada, that a lot of countries didn't make those investments and, and, and the cost afterwards or in the middle of it is much higher uh, and it's much more difficult to solve for the problems that had been put before people and with solutions. And so we're, we're not quite there, I hope, uh, with with climate, there's still room to build in more resilience and to take steps to correct for that. But talk to us a little bit more about your your take that um, you know how is Canada doing right now in 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 the wake of uh, a year of this pandemic? Canadians, you say, perform brilliantly. We've risen to the challenge on from a values measure of solidarity and responsibility and being there for one another. Um, and I think the question on a lot of people's minds is, is what's next for the economy? How, how are we going to come out of this? We're anticipating um, a budget. Uh, there's been a lot of money spent. So <laughs> maybe give us some insights on, you know, how you see the end of this. If it is the end, hopefully it is, and how we start to come out of it. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the, I mean, first thing, just quickly on COVID, which one of the lessons, I think, of COVID is that, uh, you know, it's hard, to, the importance of planning for failure. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, unfortunately, there's, there's worthy work that needs to be done, which will never be thanked uh, if you do it successfully, because you will have prevented a problem from happening, and you can't prove the counterfactual. So, 
you know, in, in preventing a pandemic or a, a, a global crash, um, success is an orphan, you know, but that's, that's the nature of, we need governments and agencies to do that. But, but to your, to your direct question, yes. And, and, you know, I think we should recognize, and I, and, and I hopefully Canadians do rightly recognize, um, how well, um, they performed, as you say, brilliantly in the sense of, um, uh, not just respecting each other and, and, and doing the necessary social distancing and, 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 and really living that, but also through volunteering and helping neighbors and supporting each other as much. And, and that's hugely important. And that's one of the very positive things because it shows a revealed value of you know, solidarity with each other, a sense of responsibility. And, you know, and the challenge is how do we build on that? Uh, which imperfectly brings me, but brings me to you know, sort of economic policy and, and financial policy. So the government rightly here and elsewhere, um, but I think uh, rightly here, um, took the decision to support workers and support businesses and try to bridge from the start of this pandemic to when we're, when we're released, if I can put it that way. Um, and that is, is the right thing to do. And, you know, one can, there's, there's no point in my, my view is, is, is where do we go as we start to um, uh, leave lockdown and how do we really ensure that there will be sustained growth? Um, and one of the things, there's a few things that, are, are necessary. First is, if, if we have sort of current spending, so emergency COVID spending plus regular programs, we want to transition, uh, we, we want to transition that to being in balance um, in the medium terms of kind of a three to five year type horizon, that's current spending. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously the COVID spending should go down quite quickly as the economy start, restarts. But then there's, what are we doing to, um, uh, stimulate the economy uh, in the medium term and stimulate investment and so-called capital spending and measures that are really growing the economy uh, for the future. And, and that, um, uh, there is a need for that. We're at, we are at a time where um, investment's been too low. We're going to need to create a lot of jobs. There's a complementary role for the government. And at a time where we have these two big rewirings of our economy, so to speak, the digital and the sustainable. Um, and you know, we could just let both of them happen or not happen, or certainly not happen in a way that's friendly to labor, that's inclusive, that's that's broad-based, that's regionally balanced, or government can play an important role in ensuring that these transformations are all of those things. And so that's that's a huge element of, of policy, which is looking forward to provide um, provide the direction to the economy and the support to the economy and the balance to the economy, so that we're not just growing, but we're growing in a way that's sustainable, resilient, and uh, regionally balanced. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you find, in tying into your work um, leading towards COP, is this um, way of thinking, you, you know, are you having to pitch this and sell this, or <laughs> is this, you know, when you, when you come together, are people yeah. like, yes, okay, we, let's move past that, we, we agree, like, how do we do it, and what are we doing next? And as you work towards something like COP, which is you know, a date and a goal, and I granted there's been some flexibility or some movement with the pandemic on that, but it's presumably coming. You know, where are you in that conversation um, globally uh, yeah. with other countries? Yeah, it's, uh, look, it's hugely important, this COP, um, and we have a, the good news is um, uh, there's, there's a tremendous focus on the issue, on climate change, on building, you know, more sustainable economies, not just here, but uh, globally. But that raises the ante because, you know, when policymakers, when businesses, when um, stakeholders, labor, um, uh, you know, uh, charitable sector are focused on an issue, then you better deliver and uh, better not just deliver sound bites, but actual policies that are, you know, and, and steps that are going to move it. I think the first thing, uh, one of the big points of emphasis has been to say to policymakers that uh, it's really important to have not just the policies today, but predictability about where your policies are going tomorrow. And um, it's a point that Janet Yellen and I made over the, been making over the last six months until she went and took another job, um, <laughs> uh, which is that sort of path of predictability and credibility matters. Because if we also have a financial sector that is strong, but is more focused on climate change because it has the information, has the tools, then the change is brought forward and it's smoothed as opposed to happening, happening, uh, you know, at a, at a blunt point in the future. So for example, here in Canada, the, uh, the carbon price path, um, price on pollution, I don't know the 
polite way to say it, but you know, the carbon price path out to $170 by 2030 is exactly the right policy for that because you can start adjusting today for it. It's a smoother adjustment and that adjustment will bring growth. It's a similar thing in Europe where, and the UK where internal combustion engines will no longer be for sale after 2030. Um, well, that tells me if I'm in the auto sector or the parts sector or the steel sector, the battery sector, where do I make my investments? And actually because it's Europe and, and, and the UK, it's big enough that it sort of tells the rest of the advanced world where things are headed. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't think it's totally accidental that, that GM, which you know, has an important business uh, in Europe, but not decisive business in Europe has, has taken the steps after uh, that they have after Europe. Um, so um, it, it, the, the policies matter, but also the, the, the predictability of those, of those policies uh, and the credibility around them uh, are, are hugely important. Tremendously. You're, you're very passionate about climate and um, the book illustrates also deeply informed and well-read and um, a great deal of homework and thought has, has gone into this. Where, where does that um, passion come from or that commitment to climate uh, come from in the wake of this financial trajectory that you have, um, yeah. have been on? Well, I think the um, I, uh, ob um, objectively passionate or rationally passionate, if you're allowed to be rationally passionate, uh, when I was the central bank governor, in the sense of, um, you know, when I went to the UK, the I mean, the responsibilities of the Bank of England are just, I mean, they're much broader than the, those of the Bank of Canada. So um, one of the things, it seems like a detail, but it's really important, is the Bank of England oversees the world's fourth, fourth largest insurance industry, including Lloyd's of London, which does all the catastrophic risk insurance, or not all of it, but most of it, uh, around the world. And if you, if that's your job to oversee them, you realize instantly their biggest issue is what's the trajectory of climate change, and their biggest challenge is that you know these extreme weather events have been tripling in recent decades, and the costs have gone up fivefold, and it's you know it's on a parabola. So um, it's um, uh, it's it's immediately relevant there. First point. Second is that uh, it really brought home to me that this issue that, you know, one thought, okay, it's a massive issue, been aware of it for a long time, uh, worked a bit uh, in the Department of Finance, as you may know, and um, on some of the plans to try to deal with it, but this expectation that it was being dealt with, and then just this realization that it's not being dealt, it's not being dealt with, it's not really being dealt with like any other serious problem, and it's um, partly because of the values issue and the nature of humanity of you know uh, uh, the tragedy that arises and not discounting the future, not bringing the future forward, um, and uh, and so at a minimum uh, to get to the punchline as a as a central banker is was to put in place all the mechanisms so the market could see the risks and then be on the hook for or or, or take the view on, on 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 how to address them. Now, then you need government policies, then you need uh, public opinion, and then you need businesses, the best businesses and, and financiers to act. Um, you know, from my perspective now, outside, I'm no longer constrained, as you can tell, um, by <laughs> my central banking. This is me unconstrained, Anna. Um, is, um, the, um, uh, there is a huge, um, there's a huge set of uh, things that need to happen in order to address the issue. And there's an enormous commercial opportunity that's that's coming from this because, you know, if you have a massive problem, a solution to a massive problem, is 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 valuable. Um, and if it's an existential problem, it's extremely valuable. And so uh, now the focus is uh, my focus, a part you know, part and parcel of the UN work is trying to turn that um, uh, not just have that opportunity, but to encourage people to uh, realize it. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering in the in the again in the global context, um, you know, it doesn't feel it, it wasn't that long ago when we were just a few thousand votes shy in Georgia and Pennsylvania of a potential reelection of of President Trump and the sort of sigh of relief that came uh, for progressives certainly uh, in the Canada 2020 community uh, around that outcome and you know what role does the U the U S play when you're you're looking at this this job you have right now, and even in as you write this book through a pandemic and through an election period, essentially where we didn't really know, uh, we hoped, or we didn't know the outcome could be. What is what is your view on the context right now of the American leadership on, on this file, and 
how impactful was was the election outcome from your point of view? Uh, well, hugely impactful, um, and um, not just in terms of the result, but in terms of the follow through thus far. So, uh, and that starts with. Um, it starts with uh, personnel, um, not just the president, the vice president, but uh, Secretary Yellen, who's very, you know, huge range of talents, but and including very, very knowledgeable about these sets of issues. Brian Deese, who's running the National Economic Council. I mean, this is his area. He worked for President Obama on it. Uh, Jake Sullivan, who uh, National Security Council, and that integration of economic and security policies there. Obviously, John Kerry, very prominent, knowledgeable, and hugely effective. Uh, all the way down through to um, the chief of staff of uh, Janet Yellen used to run the TCFT, which is a, sounds like a plumbing issue, but it's a very, you know, the most important <laughs> bit of climate disclosure. Uh, so you, you, you've got all of that and huge momentum uh, that comes with it. And, and an American um, financial system and business community that was headed in this direction independently because they're more or less global had been somewhat hamstrung if not, right. in some cases, quite hamstrung by the previous administration now unleashed. So all of that is uh, to the good, uh, you know, but I'll be candid as well. I mean, the, one of the issues of, of um, sharp shifts, and anytime you have a country that has a sharp shift in policy based on, you know, a, a couple of key states, um, the question becomes, is the consensus forming around those issues? Um, so that they, you can rely on them, um, uh, you know, going forward, going over over the course of the next uh, next decade and and beyond. Uh, and I'd like to think uh, so. And I'd like to think that part of what will come out in the next few years will be this the positive side of dealing with climate change, the competitiveness side, the job creation side, the uh, you know, and just the improvements in quality of life that can come with it uh, yeah. will help make will help depoliticize. Uh, big elements of it and you know we should always have a competition for ideas um, around how best to tackle and where the priority should be but in terms of the objective and how to measure progress against objective uh, hopefully that mainstreams and you know again from a COP perspective or broader financial perspective that's 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 what we're trying to do I mean we're not it's not a, a partisan issue yeah it's it's tricky uh, with the the climate that we live in with social media and how issues get shaped and contorted. And uh, climate, I think, has been a part of that. There are many others that we're dealing with through COVID as well, whether it's the question of vaccinations. But trying to break through with a message that is that is values-based, that people yeah. trust. And even you in your book, you talk about trusting science and listening more to science and, and science-based policy. You know, how, how impactful do you find that churn? Or you've just recently joined Twitter, so maybe you're not in the churn. <laughs> But it's for, for those of us who watch, you know, how to, you know, support leaders in the in more in the political space, perhaps to get into a position where they can make these kinds of decisions and lead on these kinds of issues. It's a big piece of the, of the puzzle. And how do you how do you break through and bring um, bring up that kind of positive values based message, which seems to make so much sense to us. But there are people out there who just don't who don't see it that way. And it's reinforced in that world. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, yeah, uh, there's definite, you know, huge evidence of uh, polarization across a wide range of issues and, uh, and um, algorithms that are reinforcing that, that polarization and, and, uh, and, and one has to recognize. I think the, there is a, you know, what starts with uh, any, any change is, also, is trying to see how that change affects those, uh, and the book talks about this, those on the periphery. You see most clearly when you see from the periphery. So, you know, you see the economy most clearly if, if you're unemployed or, or you know, the, the police if you're, if you're persecuted or, 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 you know, you're subject to systemic racism or, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and climate and climate transition if you're um, in an industry that is uh, immediately affected or prospectively affected by that transition. And, and, and so, I, it, you know, it's easy to say, it's harder to do, but to, to try to look from those perspectives um, and understand and then see how what you're doing, you know, addresses the natural concerns that will be there. Now, you, you'll never, you know, some people you'll, you'll never fully win over and, and, and often, some issues are proxies for other issues sometimes, as you, you know better than I, uh, and one has to recognize that as, as, as well. Um, it is important, though, to, um, 
I, I think the other thing is, is on big issues, it's important to go big. Um, it is important to have big objectives um, and work for it because you will spend a lot of capital. Um, even as a central banker, you've come with a certain amount of capital beyond that, which is on the balance sheet. Um, and so you better be looking for something that is going to make a material difference and is consistent with the value or the objective that you're, you're trying, to, uh, trying to accomplish. You're trying to pursue. Yeah. We have quite a few questions here. I Sorry, I keep darting my eyes. <laughs> I'm listening and the questions are, are flowing in. So I may just take a, a moment here and um, bring in someone from our audience. I see there's a question here from uh, James uh, Lormier in Halifax. And his view is that missing from the short list of big crises is the dramatic explosion of inequality and the channeling of so much of the increased wealth to the very wealthy. Um, is exploding inequality just as much a need of action as the other area items that we've, we're tackling in this? Yeah, case? absolutely, James. I mean, I think the, um, and, and two, two things about it. One, and the book goes into some detail about this, at least from my perspective, which is that we've, we've had this build in inequality Canada more of an outlier, uh, uh, in part because of government policy and um, uh, and uh, transfers to individuals, which have which have helped dampen that relative to other countries, and it is that is notable. Um, but in general, there are these bigger forces of inequality, partly from globalization, but very importantly from technology. Um, obviously, obviously, and sadly, the COVID crisis has deepened those fissures in our society. We see it, you know, across. Uh, whether it's uh, in terms of gender, in terms of uh, racialized groups, uh, Indigenous uh, Canadians, uh, in terms of the health outcomes and uh, the economic outcomes, or you know, this sort of material uh, deterioration there, education outcomes uh, across uh, different uh, social strata in the country. Um, so, so that's been reinforced. And then on top of that is we have the acceleration of a series of new technologies, application of new technologies from AI through to bioengineering, um, the nature of um, uh, nature of work, nature of commerce, all of which, if they're anything like previous big technological periods of technological change, will increase inequality. So there, absolutely. I mean that that um, but that runs through the book in terms of um, uh, these are the forces that are there, and what it argues um, from a position of you know leadership of companies and uh, investors, but very much countries is recognize those forces up front uh, and that we're in the midst of them and lean against them uh, quite deliberately uh, and that requires reforms to um, uh, to how we educate uh, it requires changes to our tax system to advantage labor over capital we we're, we have it the other way around or more specifically skills development uh, over uh, over capital investment uh, it requires changes to uh, in my judgment to uh, uh, fairly you know, substantial changes to the way we trade um, to support trade and services, which benefit women more than uh, more than men, um, and uh, trade for small, medium-sized enterprises, a small business, free or trade for small business, the sort of, uh, to Canadianize it, the Shopify platform economy, make that as seamless as possible, because that is not regionally specific. Um, that is inclusive, because these are new uh, entrepreneurial businesses. Um, and you build that ecosystem. And again, I'm sorry to go into the plumbing, but part of the reason why the book reaches that is I was trying to make these ideas, ground them as much as possible. So actually you need to, uh, we should change the way we conduct payments um, in the country and uh, including through central bank digital currencies and other things because for, they're goods in and of themselves, but they help uh, rebalance the way globalization works, the way technology is applied, the type of jobs that are created. Um, so whether it's in Halifax or um, or you know or Montreal, um, uh, there, there there is you know the, the the world as your market is 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 there as quickly as it as it should be. So it's the question spot on, um, but it's the crises that the the specific crystallization of crises that that uh, then lead to well, what. What do we learn? What values do we learn from that? And then how, how do we address it in a way that, uh, uh, as, as, the, as the title says, uh, builds a better world for all? A, uh, I think you say at the end, a planet worthy of our grandchildren. Is the, worthy of our grandchildren, yeah. Because yeah. cool. that was the line was um, after the First World War was, uh, 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 you know, a Britain fit for, for our children. Uh, and, and there was this huge series of uh, reforms there. Mm -hmm. uh, so COVID is a war, then uh, how about a planet for our grandchildren? 
Well, I have a question here along those lines as well from uh, David Hunter. It doesn't say where David is joining us from. He asks, what are your thoughts on establishing metrics that measure progress towards an economy based on human values? Uh, for example, in addition to or instead of GDP. And to quote, what gets measured gets watched and what gets watched gets done. Uh, FYI, I am a grandfather who wants to help leave the world a better place uh, for all grandchildren. That's the spirit, David. Um, I, I think I, I, very important, um, you know, broadening out the metrics by which we measure things. Um, and actually, I go through in some detail uh, in the book about the value of sort of absolute metrics. So let's say in the case of human progress, um, uh, uh, instead of trying to emphasize or estimate, and believe it or not, people do a dollar value of human capital, but actually, you know, certain educational attainment or uh, or outcomes in terms of uh, employment and, uh, uh, and and relative equality of employment, or to measure more broadly um, on the natural capital side, you know, okay, so the Canadian, you know, physical balance sheet um, uh, of our of our natural capital, are we adding to it? Or are we subtracting from it? Unfortunately, you know, we've been subtracting uh, over, over the last half century. We've started adding back in recent years. How do we track it? So yes, on metrics. And um, there is a lot of work that has been done to do it. And the only caution, I'll finish with this, on metrics, um, and it goes to back to kind of the original thesis of the book around market society is we need to be very careful on those types of broader um, uh, uh, welfare metrics, so human experience, uh, flourishing metrics, not to, there's always a temptation for people like me, economists knows, is to put them into dollar values. Mm. So you can compare them and you can compare them to uh, profit or, uh, or measures of GDP. And the challenge is when you mix the two, then you end up in an economic world of trade-off uh, all very quickly, and um, it's um, it's a it's a mixture of the of, of the sacred and the and the secular that uh, doesn't lead to uh, the best outcomes in my judgment. No, you you explain that a little bit in the book, actually more than a little bit about the per the value of a human life and this conversation. Yeah. I guess that's taken place in the insurance, predominantly maybe the insurance industry, and from a health policy point of view, which I had never encountered as as a uh, as a concept, it's it was quite something to try it's to wrap. Remarkable, I yeah, you know the uh, uh, the, I mean there are these estimates of value of human life, value of statistical life, and they're actually used not just in insurance but in um, in public policy. So uh, judgments about whether to have a road or to have a regulation will weigh the cost of that relative to lives saved or lost, uh, depending on how you look at it. And I think what's interesting. And it's all based, sorry, just I mean, it's interesting details. It's actually more, it's a detail that really matters, which is it's almost all based on, uh, it's either surveys or judgments of if you, if you took a slightly risky job um, and um, you were paid a bit more for that, uh, let's say you were a bike courier um, or something, you know, or there's some greater risk. And, and, and if you're paid a premium, small premium for that, it's implied that you have calculated your relative odds of dying as a bike courier. And then that is used to estimate the value of life. And the value of life in Canada is, you know, it's, um, it, there's a range, but let's call it a million and a half. Um, by the way, that's what our lives are worth on a statistical basis, um, and uh, which is nice to know. Um, now, when you get to COVID, people's revealed preference is absolute, is totally inconsistent with that. They value their lives and the lives of others far higher degree. And so it just shows you the limits of this type of monetization approach. Uh, and uh, we need, need to be really careful. It can inform decisions, but it shouldn't make decisions. Uh, and, um, and, and yet it's at the heart of, of public policy. Yeah. It kind of, that ties in a little bit to a question that I had here about um, healthcare. Uh, from Paul Sulkers. He, he writes, in order to demand and improve our competitiveness, other countries have invested in strong primary care and home care services. Many consumers pay very high value, uh, place very high value on primary care to assist or guide them. However, primary care is the lowest funded element of our public health system. Can the provincial and federal health sector apply your shift from market values to human values to achieve this vision where the current market limits investments mm -hmm. that drive long-term value within, a short, within short term election cycles? It's a great, uh, well, it's an interesting question. It's not one of my areas of no. 
expertise, if I have areas of expertise, but the, I guess the, 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 the way I would look at that, um, if understand, understanding the question as I do, is um, partly not just on measures of um, health outcomes, or let, let me reframe, um, broader human outcomes, uh, you know, health outcomes is part of that in terms of primary care, but also broader measures of well-being, um, whether it's mental health or, you know, other measures of flourishing, and, and how, you know, what, what, it, what is accomplished in the round relative to, um, relative to the cost versus, um, uh, you know, instead of home care, um, uh, institutional care, if I, if I put it more, more broadly like that. It's one of the questions, I mean, we're in COVID and we are where we are, but uh, it's not always clear that we're optimizing across broader measures of welfare for individuals, including children, for you know different provincial rules on schooling, for example, mm -hmm. uh, which it, you know it just and and I'm you know not I'm sorry, but the there is there might not have been evidence in March of 2020, but there's a lot more evidence now in terms of the impact of different types of schooling on uh, on children's well-being and and family well-being uh, by extension, which. From a broader welfare perspective, that should uh, should be brought into consideration. Mm -hmm. It's it's the broader conversation about valuing, adding more value to these and paying people what they they should be earned for these critical roles in our society yeah. that have been yeah. undervalued. The nurses and the teachers, and for example, people stocking the shelves in our grocery store. And I think that reality has certainly been brought to the fore and come into focus this year, and and on how much. Our day-to-day -day lives uh, rely on these on these people showing up uh, for work every day, and how they make everything function and work. Certainly, as a parent uh, of three school-aged children, uh, <laughs> that came into stark stark focus in in our house. And we're, you know, um, as you've said as well, like everyone's been in a different boat, sort of navigating the same storm. And uh, but this this uh, theme of undervaluing the people who um, really make things function uh, and are so important in our society has really um, has been has been accentuated I would yeah say. I, and I do two quick things on that I mean yes part of that is and not you're saying this but part of it is recognition um, and valuing people and um, uh, and uh, but part of it also is paying people in a way that for all the states of the world in which they work so I mean it's not like any of our uh, nurses or healthcare professionals were saying, "I'll just work in normal times, and then when things get tough, actually I'll step back." You know, but yet they're they're paid when things are tough as if they're in normal times yeah. uh, entirely. Same with uh, uh, people stocking our shelves or delivering our packages. Yeah, exactly. Um, we have many more questions. Let's see, um, they're popping up as we chat. Um, So one question here from Graham Campbell in Ottawa. He says, do you foresee how the values contributed by the natural environment could be incorporated into economic analysis and decision making? Currently, these values are ignored. So you do offer quite a lot of recommendations yeah. in the third, the last third of the book to corp, to business, to political leaders, public sector leadership. Uh, there's a really a rich, rich um, um, section of the book on recommendations and suggestions. So. Um, maybe this one is particular on the natural environment. On yeah, the I'll, I'll just say a couple of quick words on that. And this partly goes to the limits of it, um, mm -hmm. uh, of, of, of formal evaluation approach. But there's, there's, there's a few ways. The first is that what we see now in, um, in the markets, so like in the financial system, is that companies are being asked more and more to report on their impact. Um, so their impact on the environment, their impact on their communities, their impact um, on um, on, you know, on the skills of uh, their workers is three examples, but let's stay with the natural environment. So not just the climate impact on them, but what's their impact on species loss? What's their impact at, you know, in terms of use, usage of the environment positively or negatively? And, and part of the way they are valued is that at some point, uh, the uh, stakeholders care about these issues. So, for example, a good example is single-use plastics. Uh, as of a few years, all of a sudden became a very salient issue, um, and it became indefensible for a number of companies to rely on uh, single-use pl plastics. So, 
kind of becomes dynamically material. So that's a sort of negative screen of those issues. So that's one way it's valued. The second way is actually through the variety of ways that um, climate is valued and um, carbon is valued um, and a company's footprint uh, is valued. And that increasingly is coming into the market. Now, climate change is, is not the top decider at present of uh, species loss. Um, uh, other things that we do is, but, uh, um, but it, it is certainly uh, correlated with it. And so the more the climate is valued and the more the incentive to address climate change, it helps on nature. The third way, there are now starting to be valuations around uh, what are called natural uh, capital solutions or biodiversity. And some uh, investors and some shareholders will pay for that, not all, but some will. Um, and there's ways to, um, to provide disclosure and other aspects around it. The point I'd make though is this is this works up to a point, but the mark this is one of these areas where the market just isn't the solution to it. It can move in the same direction. And it's also an area where I would favor um, tracking, counting, and, and um, regulating, reinforcing the buildup of the rebuild of natural our natural environment. Um, uh, and, and measuring that on nature's own terms. So, you know, hectares of forest, hectoliters of clean water uh, species um, uh, retained, um, if you will, um, as opposed to mapping it all into a dollar figure, mm -hmm. because if you map it all into a dollar figure, then it gets pulled back into the market and we end up where we started the conversation. <laughs> That's true. Well, and, and I think in some sense, what you're saying is we've seen a bit of that with our this current government's desire to protect uh, shoreline and, and yeah. parkland. So that proactive uh, policy to just keep those things out of the equation and have no dollar value on them, but to preserve them. Yeah. Or you have it you have it off there. I mean, the, the UN literally last week came out with a system of uh, environmental accounts that's been under development for 10 years and there's 30 countries trialing it. And, you know, it's it's not the kind of thing that happens overnight, but us, you know, Canada of all places, uh, given our natural heritage, uh, we would do well that to have a natural balance sheet that is separate from the um, financial balance sheet of the country, and Canadians can judge whether we're whether we're adding or subtracting. That's a neat uh, concept, uh, and that actually segues into this next question that I have here from Alex Mallet, who's with the School of Public Policy uh, and Administration in Ottawa. He writes, you mentioned the rewiring of our economies towards those that are more sustainable and resilient and that the role of government is to help ensure that these changes are more inclusive, equitable, and regionally balanced. In these sustainable transitions, where do you think Canada can punch above our weight and demonstrate leadership globally? Wow, okay. Um, well, I, I think, um... I do think on the uh, carbon price, uh, we're demonstrating leadership. I mean, the 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 both legs of it, the this the predictability, which I talked about earlier, but the recycling of um, uh, of the money and keeping you know two thirds or seventy percent of Canadians net ahead. I know that people, you know, not everybody might see it that way, but that is the that is the fact in terms of the um, of the impact on the balance sheet. So that's one way. I think secondly, the um, you know, we are, um, to use a phrase uh, coined uh, a decade or so ago, we are an energy superpower um, and we're superpower though, but we're superpower because we have multiple energy sources. And so yeah. the issue is transitioning um, and we shouldn't shy away from that, from uh, the energies of today and, and our strengths there to um, the, the cleaner energies of the future. And, and we can really punch, punch above our weight and, you know, for our own good, um, first and foremost, by, um, you know, reinforcing the, the technological genius and innovation that we have in, in our energy sector, in, in particularly in Western Canada, reinvesting as much as necessary um, in that transition, including regional support uh, in the transition, uh, and showing that it can be done and emerging um, with, uh, with an even, you know, cleaner uh, energy, uh, energy source. Um, I, by the way, I would a cleaner energy source, but also with people better off um, as a consequence of that, and and uh, and not um, uh, not having um, uh, you know deep challenges in the area that, in, in the region that um, uh, where the transition is happening. I'll, I'll say another thing and then hand back, which is you know we're in a position as, as you know where we're eighty five percent basically clean grid. Um, well, you know being one hundred percent clean grid is pretty obvious place to go, um, and getting there sooner than others. Uh, and then growing that grid and growing an industrial base that is built off of 
uh, clean energy is uh, is absolutely something we could do and uh, and should do well should should have a serious national conversation about uh, accomplishing that mm -hmm. not just conversation actually have, have a serious action about it well, conversation first and then action but yeah <laughs> I like your book, Conversation Then Action. Um, the, uh, sorry, I had a question there and then I lost um, my train. Well, I was thinking actually about the, so when we talk about the carbon budget, uh, that's described in the book. And I guess for, for folks in that space, it's a common term of sort of what's left in the atmosphere in terms of what we can emit or spend from a carbon point of view. And then we have this goal of net zero at, at 2050. And I think you said in an interview or I read that there, there's roughly 10 years in the carbon budget and we're working towards 2050 for net zero. So I would presume yeah. there's some math how, there, how but there's, also, <laughs> yeah, there's also some technology uh, when we talk about uh, punching above our weight or what where we can lead. Um, from your perch, do you, do you have any... Um, you know, exciting things that um, you see on the horizon in terms of the technology that might help us close that gap between the 10 years in the carbon budget and the 2015 uh, yep. net zero goals. Like what, what are, what can we look forward to and what, which, what should we be looking at in terms of taking carbon out of the air perhaps? Yeah, okay. So uh, just for those who, uh, who might not follow this as closely as you and, and, and some others on the call, uh, to be clear, like if, with th this is all in the probability space, but with a 66% probability, we will um, not hit one and a half degrees if we just we the world keep emitting at the pace we're emitting at present. Um, uh, and within 10 years, we'll run it out. And that's what you know, Greta Thunberg. You know, if we've got a teenager can figure this out. We should be able to yeah. figure it out and follow through. She, she just you know the relentless logic of that, and she's right about that. Uh, that's what the science says. Now, obviously, if we bend the curve down in terms of our emissions globally, then we extend the amount of time over which we can get to net zero because, and we have to get to net zero to stabilize the temperatures. So that's what, and anything that reduces that. Um, that trajectory um, helps extend the timeline over which we can adjust. So, and, and but that's just a preamble to your question, which is what can we do? So we've got feedback somehow, um, but or at least I do. Um, yeah. Oh, that's better. I can hear you. It's a little choppy yes. there. Okay. Yeah. Um, the um, what what can we do? I mean, one of the things we can do is accelerating the um, you know getting to a clean grid uh, without question. Um, we have in Canada, um, uh, look, we, we, we should uh, as much as possible um, accelerate the emission reduction in buildings, all buildings in Canada. So being very aggressive on building ret retrofits. There's some great Canadian companies who help out on for commercial buildings on what's called HVAC optimization. So, you know, the heating and, and, and air conditioning, like it'd be, it'd be nice to be using the air conditioner. I'm kind, of, kind of miss it. We don't need it at the moment, but, um, but just optimize and use of that and, you know, reduce by a third. So there's things in the machine learning AI space, which we can do it as well. But, um, uh, you know, the big, and, and, and I think governments and companies in the country are focused on this. And the question is, do we have the right overall policy mix and can we, uh, 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 maximize the opportunities around blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, carbon capture, direct air capture, um, and uh, as, as, as some of the biggest uh, opportunities which have global application. And, uh, and those are areas which uh, are good for Canada, but good globally, um, and um, also have regional application that, you know, in a transition um, help uh, offset um, uh, adjustments that will come, may come. So there is, there is, um, there are reasons again behind the optimism and the, and the, the sense that we can, we can. There's, and I would say, and you know, I'm interested in people's views on this, but there, there's definitely reasons for the optimism and there's opportunities. It requires, though, you know, we need to be very deliberate about it. We need to decide where we're going. Um, it requires, you know, multi, you know, it requires companies, investors, governments, people pushing in the same direction and, and putting a stake in the ground of where we want to get to uh, and concentrating on a few big things. And uh, absolutely, we can get there if we, if we do all that. And in the, in the recommendations and the sort of policy guidance that you provide in the, the later part of the book, 
is really directed at decision makers and CEOs and senior government kind of officials. For the folks on the call today, you know, where what would you suggest that we do when we when we get off this Zoom call today? What can we as as citizens do to to lean in and help you know create the momentum that we need to um, force action and a plan as you've described? Well, we're I mean. You're a fairly influential group that you convene, um, uh, and we all can be influential um, on these issues. Um, I think the, you know, if you if you bring it down to the the personal level, uh, so you, we work for organizations. Well, does my organization, if, if it's a company, does it have a plan for net zero? Uh, if not, why not? Is it a credible plan? Does it make sense over what horizon? Um, does my uh, does my government uh, you know does my government have a plan? How is my money uh, you know whatever money I've been able to set aside for you know maybe for my kids or for my retirement is that being invested in a way that's consistent with my values and my objectives? And if my financial institution can't tell me, well you know why not or let's go find one that can tell you. And I would say that you know the the, the push with COP is that um, it's not just financial institutions um, to make these commitments towards net zero, but to be able to transparently say where they are on that horizon. Um, and that ultimately has to be translated to people in ways that everyone can understand so you can make those decisions. So those are a few, uh, a few of the ways. And you know, there's lifestyle and other choices that people can make in their, in their own judgment to uh, uh, to live those values. But I, I'll say another thing, which, I mean, we've rightly taught um, a lot about climate, but there is there are broader issues which go back to this sort of balance of market economy, market society, what are the values? And one of the things which again we have seen during COVID, restricted as people have been, is 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 charity or or community acts and support volunteerism. And that is a value in and of itself, but it is contagious. It promotes more charity. It you know it reinforces and it's something that that grows with use. Um, it's a, you know I've, I've used the analogy. It's a muscle that grows with use, whereas there is a side of unfortunately uh, discovered in working on this book a fairly large portion of economics which views it as a scarce resource like anything else, uh, which is why sometimes uh, they advocate having you know the state or others provide something which is. Um, uh, which is really uh, best provided by by individuals who are who are part of society. Mm -hmm. Well, we're almost uh, out of time, and I thought uh, perhaps in, in a last question, you can share any final thoughts you have as well. Uh, but to kind of circle back to the to the values question, which you just um, the values component of this, which uh, you just touched on again, but. In the book, you know, you suggest that we got to reinforce our core values, which are compassion, responsibility, you see a solidarity, and create um, a dynamism that will foster prosperity for all, essentially, and to, to move this thing forward. So how, what do those values mean to you personally? How did you come to hold those values? And then if we were to go up from the individual, which is where we were just, um, where we just were, but to the national level, how do we Marshall political processes to ensure those values um, achieve scale in some way. Yeah. Uh, okay. So we'll um, call it a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little and a big question. The um, you know from a personal perspective, I mean, I you know, I think a lot of these values I I got well, I mean, got first and foremost from my family and uh, community. Um, uh, growing up in Edmonton, and um, uh, but you know from Canada, I mean, the nature of the country is. Uh, I mean, this is a very dynamic country. It's changed a lot. There's lots of innovation, lots of, you know, we, we talked a lot about energy and certainly I saw that over, over my whole life in terms of what's happened in Canada, uh, in Alberta. Um, but a sense of community and a sense of responsibility and also, um, and this is where the solidarity comes in, not just in terms of helping each other, but the way we make decisions, which kind of segues into the, um, I guess, into uh, the political uh, process. But I think um, there's a series of complex issues we face around the digital economy and how it comes in, the sustainable economy, how it comes in, uh, that backdrop as uh, the question earlier about uh, inequality that we have in those forces. So, so what are the goals that we should set ourselves that will help turn 
digitization, the you know, sustainableization, to coin that as a term, in a way to, uh, to build for all. And yeah. then how do we work back to get them? And one of the points I make, and uh, it may sound slightly apocryphal, but uh, I, I finished the book on humility as one of the values and the, you know, the importance of, uh, and there's different aspects of humility. One is humility for leaders and recognize you don't have all the answers and that you know, you're a custodian of your institution, but also humility in the sense of you do setting goals without necessarily knowing exactly how you're going to get there and trusting a process and having processes that bring people in with consensus to achieve those goals and, and they will come. And that's what we're, what we are all trying to do as Canadians and, and hopefully the world on, um, on sustainability. Uh, and it's what we need to do more broadly uh, on, uh, on building a, building a better society for all. Thank you very much, Mark, for uh, sharing that hour of your day with us. I'm sure you're, you're super busy right now. And congratulations again on the book. It's uh, quite an accomplishment. Uh, I'm going to finish it. <laughs> I, I did my best over the weekend, full disclosure, but um, it is dense, and, uh, but very, uh, very thought provoking and um, a great contribution. Dense, dense and yet accessible at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's right. Okay. Enjoy All your right. afternoon and uh, thanks again to everybody for joining us uh, for this 2020 event. And um, yeah, well, it's sunny and cold here, but uh, hopefully everyone can get out and enjoy some fresh air today as well. Thanks Great. very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Bye, Mark. Bye.